How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, New Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. Well, it's Wednesday here on this program. You know what that means. we got a lot to get into today. AW Dynamite coming up tonight. Got some big matches scheduled for that show. Apparently, it's Shark Week. So we got a shark cage where the Jericho Appreciation Society will be suspended. Is it one giant shark cage? Is it uh, multiple small shark cages? Are we going to jam a bunch of them into a four foot by five foot box? What are we going to do here tonight? We'll find out. But it's a barbed wire death match. Eddie Kingston and Chris Jericho. There will be blood tonight. So you don't like that. Well, I don't know what to tell you. Because there's going to be blood tonight. And a bunch of other matches as well, which we will get into. We've also got some notes on Ric Flair. And, of course, having his last match. But he's also did an interview talking about being removed from the WWE Open. And then being put back in. Which uh, is interesting. Probably not for the reasons that you're thinking. But I'll talk to you about that today. We've got the Raw ratings from Monday night. Raw did much better than expected, going head-to-head with the Home Run Derby. A shockingly good number. And as it pertains to WWE and shocking, that NXT Women's Battle Royal, it's not going to win a single vote for Match of the Year. Don't get me wrong. But that was so much better than I expected it to be. And we had a surprise winner, and the crowd loved it. And nobody got hurt, which is the most important thing. So we'll tell you about that, as well as the NXT 2.0 review today. So a lot to get into. You can text us 425-780-7566. Back in a moment with more Wrestling Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Semper, VB, also of WrestlingObserver.com. we got a lot of news to get into here today. But I am going to start with a note on NXT 2.0. I realize they say it's my favorite show. It's really not my favorite show. But I think it's fair to say that I enjoy the show more than most. Would that be fair? I think I that, enjoy the that show would be fair. Yeah. more than most. Yeah. Uh-huh. But listen, okay? There's, there's, there's being a gimmick and there's being honest, okay? And I don't want to hear anybody try to tell me that that Battle Royal was bad, okay? Was it the match of the year? Absolutely not. But you know what? I've been ridiculing the idea of this Battle Royal for a week now, Okay. There's absolutely no reason that this thing should be any good at all. They have a whole, they have 20 women. Probably, I'd have to look at the whole lineup, but I mean, probably half of them shouldn't even be on TV right now. And they're all in a chaotic match, in which you really, I mean, you could practice to a degree, but it's not like practicing a one-on-one singles match you can choreograph. I mean, there's, there's just things everywhere. It's, it's chaotic. They have to be thrown over the top rope to the floor. This was a recipe, a recipe for, quite frankly, a lot of material, okay? But, was it Saramato? Who put this together? Whoever put this together needs a, a raise immediately, okay? So they had 21 women, actually, because Zoe Stark comes out as the surprise number 21. She hasn't been around since November, when she tore something in her knee, I can't remember which uh, which ligament it was, but she's been out for eight months, and she comes back as the big surprise final person to enter this battle royal. So they do this battle royal, and it is impossibly booked, where the women that should not be on TV, I mean, they're lifted over the top, they're helped the entire way, they got them out of the thing as quickly as possible, and then... All of the women who are capable of doing a battle royal, they had some very clever spots with all of the women that could actually competently work this battle royal. So I'm watching and I'm going, holy smokes, this is like way better than I expected. And then, you know, it comes down to the final four or whatever. And uh, then we've got we've got Tiffany Stratton and Zoe Stark. They're the last two in there. And it wasn't perfect. And the funny thing, actually, is that Tiffany Stratton was, like, an excellent high-level gymnast. And she's so tired she can't do a skin the cat at the end. 
that was something to see. But then she immediately does a round off two back handsprings into the corner. She could pull that off somehow. But anyway, they're going back and forth and they're throwing each other. And there were some dumb spots like, you know, Wendy Chu gets thrown over the top, but she lands on her own pillow. But they don't count that as being on the floor, which I've argued this many times. It's preposterous. I mean, so anyway, she gets back in the ring and then she gets thrown out again. So Tiffany Stratton, she gets thrown out, but only one foot touches. They're doing the, you know, back and forth and whatever. And finally, she gets tossed out. And Zoe starts, and everyone starts cheering. She's the winner, blah, blah, blah. And as she's cheering, just like in every Battle Royal, you see the diabolical Cora Jade, who just turned heel, sneak into the ring. And she's down in the corner, and she's ready to pounce. And everyone's like, no! And she runs at Zoe Stark, and Zoe ducks, boom! And she throws her over the top to the floor and eliminates her. It was so good. And then the fans are, like, going crazy because they, like, saw this miracle battle royal. And then, you know, everyone's cheering for Zoe Stark. And Zoe Stark, she goes over and she points at Mandy Rose, who's on the whatever. And they point out Mandy Rose and Toxic Attraction are the ones that jumped and injured Zoe Stark eight months ago. Now Zoe Stark has won this battle royal. She gets a shot at Mandy Rose for the title. I was like, what the heck? How did they pull this off? How? But I am a man who is willing to say I was wrong. I was wrong. I thought this was going to be horrible. I was just, I was so excited to watch this match. I was just, I was more giddy than I am right now. I'm like, oh man, let's see what's going to happen. I can't just wait to see what Ulyssa Leon does in this match. And dude, <laughs> they pulled it off. It's like, if they would have done this battle royal a hundred times, I'm not sure any of them would have been better than this one. It was good. So anyway, that was the main event of NXT 2.0 and they did it. So, good for them. I am nothing if not a fair man. <laughs> oh, yeah. I am. And I was not looking forward to that. Ba- I, that's a lie. I was looking forward to the Battle Royal because I thought it was going to be a bunch of knees and elbows and fists flying, back fists in people's faces, and a foot catching somebody in the nose as they get tossed over the top rope, but we didn't get that. And the build-up to it, we only heard from a handful of people. The people you would expect to hear from, Nikita Lyons, Lash Legend, those types of people leading into it, Tiffany Stratton. So you knew it was going to be about the bigger names when it all shook out. And it was. Zoe Stark makes her re-debut. And I know probably there are people that have their favorites in NXT, and Zoe Stark may not be one of them. I would say... Give me anybody on that roster and forget about who's got the most WWE potential a year, two, three years down the road, whatever Vince likes. But I'd argue I'd put Zoe Stark against anybody else on that roster for the most part. Put her against She's very Mandy good. Rose. Yeah. Put her against Mandy Rose. I'm taking Mandy Rose. Put her against Cora Jade. I'm taking Zoe Stark. Not because. Wait, you're taking Mandy more... Rose? You're taking Mandy Cora Rose Jade. over Zoe Stark? Or, excuse me. Zoe Stark. Yes. Yes. I'm taking over Mandy Rose. Yes. Zoe Stark, I'm taking over Cora Jade. I'll over a lot of people right now. So I don't know if she's going to be the per- person that actually ends up dethroning Mandy Rose. It may be Roxy. We'll have to see. But I like the fact that there's another threat to Mandy. And I like the fact that Zoe's back because she is good. We're not going to get EO back. So... Zoe, the next best thing? I, I don't know. But with her experience level and the fact that she can work with everybody, it's a plus for me. Yeah, I got one other thing I got to say about this Battle Royal, then we'll talk about the rest of the news. We'll do the full review of the show later. But what was amazing is they they did simplify a lot of things to make sure that nothing went wrong. But there were a couple things that they didn't idiot-proof, and, and they still managed to pull them off. That, I think, was what was the most impressive. Because they did a spot with Alba Fire and Lash Legend. Where oh, yeah. Where Alba Fire it's... goes up. Lash Legend's got her in powerbomb position. Zoe Stark does a Hurricane Rana on Lash Legend over the top rope, and they both tumble to the floor. If they tried that 100 times, I'm not sure they would hit it 99 times. But, man, they hit it, and they it pulled so it It was so good, I thought they messed it up. Honest to God, I'm like, was that supposed to happen? That was exactly what was supposed to happen. And once it sinks in for a second, it's like, well, that spot went perfectly. And it's like, it sounds like an insult to Lash Legend, but let's be honest here. It's not her fault. She went out there with no experience whatsoever 
And yes, Alba Fire's got a lot of it, but it is very difficult to work with somebody, especially somebody the size of Lash Legend, you know, that you're not used to throwing around and getting in there and, and messing with. And you're supposed to be doing spots with that person who's inexperienced. It's very difficult. We have AEW Dynamite tonight, and we have more added to the show. We've got the barbed wire death match, obviously. Eddie Kingston, Chris Jericho, with Jericho Appreciation Society suspended above the ring in a shark cage. We've got Luchasaurus and Christian Cage versus the Varsity Blondes. Brody King will be facing Darby Allen. John Moxley and Wheeler Yuta take on the best friends. Is it true? I think they said the best friends have never lost on Dynamite in a tag team match. Is that right? Hmm. I, I find know. that hard to believe, but that's I could be wrong about that. Jade Cargill, Kira Hogan, and Layla Gray will face Athena, Chris Statlander, and Willow Nightingale. And we will have the Swerve in our Glory Championship celebration. So that is the lineup for Dynamite tonight. And I guess we'll find out who the next challengers will be, I'd presume, for Swerve in our Glory. Because some, I mean, maybe they'll just come out and celebrate. That'd be new. It's possible. They celebrate. They drop the confetti and the balloons. They go, we did it. And then they go, to the back. And we go to another segment. Oh, yeah, confetti. Skeptical that that's that's exactly what's going to happen right there. Hey, Brian. Are you now Comfy Kingston? Are you stealing that uh, nickname from Wendy Chu? Comfy Kingston. I miss that. Yes. And so because like Kofi Kingston always had the spots in the Royal Rumble. That's what it was for Wendy Chu. Yeah. Hey, have you been tanning? Dude, I've been out in the sun nonstop. It is baking outside. I'm not sure if I mentioned it here on the show, but uh, my daughter has COVID. My wife has had symptoms for days but refuses to test positive. So we're just hanging out here in the sun all day. It's been worse, I can tell you. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Elber is here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi. Also of WrestlingObserver.com. Do you remember a long time ago, Stephanie McMahon was doing some something, and she made the comment, I don't remember what the comment was, but it was something like, uh, uh, charity work is... Uh, the new marketing or whatever? The new whatever. It was something like that. New ad. Yeah. Can anyone remember exactly what she said? Someone find it, it for me and put it here on the chat. Because, uh, yeah, that was that was an interesting statement. We don't do charity work like, you know, to be nice. I mean, we do to a degree. But mostly it's for, uh, you know. Marketing and marketing for publicity. Reason. And look, she said the quiet part out loud. I mean, let's let's be honest about this. Yes, anybody, any major corporation that does charity, they have more money at their disposal to give out, to donate, to do things with. But every single last one of them, that's why every single ribbon has got a color attached to it. There is a marketing campaign attached to charity, and depending on the size of it, like a Susan G. Komen, and depending on what they do with that money, that's where it starts to really, you know, come into play on what are you really doing this for. But she, even though it was maybe nasty for people to hear, that's that's every All single right, here last it is. one of here them. It is. Here it every is. single one of them. Philanthropy is the future of marketing. Yeah. It's the way brands are going to win. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Hey, look, we always talk about the battle for public opinion and how you look in the public eye and all that sort of stuff. I mean, we see it on Twitter every day with companies making the right choice, wrong choice on how to advertise or how to celebrate something or how to... My point is, I always thought that philanthropy should kind of just be about philanthropy. You know what I mean? Really? Is it? Yeah, that's what I mean. But here's my point. Here's why I even brought it up in the first place. You actually have a point? Yeah. What you got? Well, Ric Flair says he met with Vince McMahon. Because there's nobody who's more charitable than Ric Flair. Well, you wait. Can I finish? Ric Flair said he met with Vince McMahon recently and thanked him for putting his woo back into the WWE signature opening. It had been removed from the video last September following the airing of a Dark Side of the Ring episode on 2022's plane, or 2002's Plane Ride from Hell. Two weeks ago, the woo was added back again. Flair spoke about what this meant to him on Tuesday's edition of Busted Open Radio. He also mentioned having visited with McMahon on Monday when WWE was in Tampa. I went and saw Vince yesterday 
to personally thank him because they were in Tampa, Flair said. It made me feel like my world had changed again. It made me feel a lot better than when they took me off, I can tell you that. Everything Vince McMahon has ever said to me is in, in his entire life has come true. And he said, quote, I promise that I will put you back on it. So when he took him out, he took him out solely because of the controversy. The controversy. And not because of any, like, you know, he shouldn't be in here. Uh, what he did was wrong. We should remove him. It was all, well, we're going to take him out because, you know, people are mad. So we'll take him out. But I'm going to promise him at the time, don't worry, I'll put you back in. Eh, whatever. Of course he did. So anyway. You wasted our time with that? I didn't waste everyone's time. I'm pointing out the way this company operates. How does this tie in with Stephanie, by the way? Well. When it comes to they, like legitimate giving money to charities. Well, you know, and... they, they do their good deeds, but they do their good deeds because it's good marketing. Yeah. And uh, he did his good deed of taking Flair out yeah. while promising him, don't worry, I'll put you back in. I'm Look, only it's... taking you out because, you know, other people are mad about it. Look how people will donate to GoFundMes and things like that. Some people donate, donate anonymously. Some people have got to have their name there. Thank They've you. Got Thank to you, let this person. See. I'm pointing out that all of these things are performative. Thank you. Dude, come on. What, that's a revelation now all of a sudden that everything the WWE I never said does, I had a revelation for everybody. I said I was going to point something out. Or any corporation, for that matter, is performance art. I mean, every corporation does this. They're, that's all performance art. And the same WWE is just an extra special layer of it. And to do anything with Ric Flair, who was so, his, his professional career was placed into question into his mind when Vince took him out of the opening Spend more time with your family, folks. Hey, that opening so, was important please. to Ric Flair, dude. It's important Jesus. for him to be in the opening. It is. Of it Raw. is very important for Ric Flair. And you know what? An opening. That I, I, bet you. I couldn't even tell you one other person in it right now except Ric Flair because he just mentioned it. Probably Gorilla Monsoon. I it mean, who, who Hogan else slamming are Andre in there? Is that still in there? Possibly. Hmm. Possibly, unless they throw a fit and take him out for some reason or something like that. I mean, my God. Uh, just, it's, it's craziness to me. It's crazy. This is all crazy. Ric Flair is, is nuts. Absolutely bat-ass nuts. Well, yeah. Now you're going to be talking about revelations? I know. I know. Raw. Against the Home God. Run Derby. Mm. 1.77 million viewers. 0. 0.46 at 18 to 49. This is a shockingly good number. Why did they take Ric Flair out in the first place? You want to remind everybody of that? Because of the uh, plane ride from hell or whatever. Yeah, swinging it around on the plane and uh, the the How do we get back to this? Allegations made by that woman. I, well, you know, Vince and Rick probably had a lot to talk about. And look, Ric Flair probably is absolutely telling the truth when he says Vince has never lied to him. Because to Rick, when Vince said, oh, I'm going to pay your taxes for you, and he did it. And there's lots of things where, you know what, I'm not throwing shade on Ric Flair for, you know, saying that Vince has always kept his word to him. I can absolutely believe that. It's just, look at the two people who are in on the conversation. What good guys. Well, anyway, these ratings that I was talking about here, the uh, show uh -huh. against the Home Run Derby did a good good number. 1.78 million first hour, 1.81 million third hour, 1.7 million in the third hour. You know what that means? What's that mean? I hate to tell you this. Austin Theory people want to see? It absolutely had nothing to do with Austin Theory. <laughs> but people tuned in to see Logan Paul. Oh, come on. No, they did. You sure? I'm positive. Oh, man. That was that was an incredibly strong third hour. Do we have the 15-minute ratings? Derby. That's what I want to see. I don't mm. know if I believe this. No, but you know what? I watched that show, brother, and it wasn't because of anything else in that hour. Oh, I'm man, telling did, you. Do you think people actually stayed to the very end of it with those two going back and forth with each other? Well, if it did 1.70 million, yeah. I don't know. Oof. Bro, Seven. the show opened at 1.78 million. They ended at 1.70 million. So they lost virtually nobody during the show and gained people in the second hour. So that's that's a, that's a shockingly good number for Raw. But they didn't stick around for Miz and Mrs. this time, I guess, in mass like they usually do. Well, you know, they'd seen one celeb. They'd seen Miz once. How many times do we need to see that guy during the day? I'll tell you how many. Zero. But we're forced to see him at least once. Oh. The Home Run Derby. 6.02 million viewers. 
So I don't think that shouldn't have taken a chunk out of this. 1.72 and 18 to 49 on ESPN. Kid loves the big bats. Pre show mm-hmm. for home run derby. The pre show. The pre show for the home run derby. Four million viewers and a 1.13. Now they did a Derek Jeter documentary, which did 1.84 million at a 0.57. So the Derek Jeter documentary beat Raw in viewership and 18 to 49. Maybe they need to bring that guy in. Maybe he needs to do a celeb match coming up here at SummerSlam. I'm sure he'll be first in line to do that. Well, you know, money talks, brother. Money <laughs> you talks. John Croc, you know. So there you go. I'm saving my full NXT review for the next segment. It wasn't all perfect, though. It was, no, it the wasn't. whole thing was not like the Battle Royal. Folks. I didn't. I didn't say that at all. No, I didn't say that you said that. I'm just saying that to the people that may believe that you may have said that earlier, even though you didn't say that. No, nah, people people don't ever misquote me. No, no. Hamish here says, I'm in the same boat as you, Brian. I expected the NXT Female Battle Royal to be a car crash, which he wrote in one word in all caps, but ended up being just fine. In fact, enjoyable. The finish was smart, despite the usual WWE trope finish. Cora Jade got hers in the end. She sure did. Yeah. She sure did. She got dumped over the top rope like she dumped those tag belts into the garbage. They have to just be getting rid of the tag titles. Let's hope so. I mean, there's no there's no other reason to crown new champions, break them up a week later, and then have one half of the champions throw her belt in the garbage can. That's, should have asked Sasha Banks. And if the plan that. is to keep the belts, oh man. <laughs> yeah, I don't think uh I don't think Sasha's going to NXT. I'll tell you that much. You see those cheese? That I can report. The, uh... Sasha Banks not going to NXT, as no. reported by Brian Alvarez. Yeah, man, I think that's a true one. But uh, see the cheese crisps in the uh, the trash can there. You ever have those? You ever have the the? It's just cheese that they dehydrate, and it literally is tastes like you you chopped off a block of cheese and just put it in your mouth. It's the most disgusting thing I've ever had in my life. It absolutely is. What are the I odds? I'm trying to move why... on from cheese curds. If you had cheese it, that would be perfect. What are the and odds these cheese Edge rejoins it. Judgment Day and praises them that they were ruthless enough to overthrow him? That I whole would, angle smells like cheese crisps, I would to be not, honest with you. Mike, please, can I get moving here? What are the oh, odds Edge what? rejoins Judgment Day? Edge is, uh, I think they've already got Rated R Superstar merch. So I'm pretty sure that he's returning as the Rated R Superstar. Now what that means... As a baby face, a heel, I don't know, but I don't think he's coming back to Judgment Day. Especially because he left Judgment Day, which is ironic. He left because he didn't want to be involved in anything spooky, but then they haven't done anything spooky. So I don't know what's going on. Well, aren't they doing spooky time vignettes to lead to his return? Like there's a flannel over here, there's a rated RKO shirt over here. Aren't they doing some 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 mystical things that probably play wild in the minds of Finn Balor and the and, and, and Damian Priest? I don't know what's going on, but I do know we'll be back in a moment with more Observer Live. Back on the show, Brian Elber is here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Semper, VV, also of WrestlingObserver.com. Sad to see nobody give NXT 2.0 a chance. It has improved. It was miles better than Raw and SmackDown this week. Wait, who are you talking about? NXT? You don't know if people are, are taking uh, Well, you've been talking like to Dom during the break. I've been reading the chat. Now, Man. let's talk about this show. It opened up with J.D. McDonough and Cameron Grimes, which was a good match. Because, in fact, Cameron Grimes is a great worker. J.D. McDonough actually did not look particularly good in this match. I think he's. I think this is his second match in three months. He had one match on a house show with Braun Breaker. And then he's uh, he's in here doing this and uh, uh, looked like... Uh, actually, at one point, he took like some move. I think it was like a... a Kind of a urinage, spinning urinage. It looked like he smashed his head on the mat. So he ends up uh, hitting his uh, Saito suplex or whatever and pins Grimes. I will get more into this in a bit. But Grimes loses. We had a Nikita Lyons promo, and then we had Cora Jade's promo. Listen, I heard from a lot of people that Cora Jade's promo was an atrocity, okay? It wasn't good. I would not go as far as say it was an atrocity. She does. She at least explained everything. 
which was that, you know, she's jealous of Roxanne Perez. She brought Roxanne here. Roxanne wins the tag titles. She was all excited to defend them. But the first thing Roxanne wants to do is fight for the singles title. She's upset about that. And so she had to take her out. She called her selfish and worse. And so she uh, belittles her, makes fun of her, and says, this is what I think of these tag belts now. Throws the tag belt in the garbage. So, like I said, I presume this is the end of the women's tag team titles. Because they're worthless at this point. But And I don't I don't know how knows. long the promo was for, but that's exactly what she's going to be doing on the main roster, which is regurgitating words that are not her own. And I thought she did a solid job with it. I think the inflection of her voice is the most heel thing about her because she's able to say things and make it sound like fingernails on a chalkboard. But, you know, it was a long promo and it was drawn out for quite some time because she's trying to remember all of the verbiage, but she did a good job repeating all of it without any mess ups. But man, you could tell it was all on a piece of paper for her. We had Zion Quinn doing a promo saying that Apollo Crews couldn't cut it in the big leagues and they will be having a match next week on NXT. <laughs> Indy Hartwell did a promo and, uh, actually made fun of herself without directly doing it. But she said, there's been ups and downs and slips and slides. Because, of course, she slipped off the ropes and fell down last week. And she vowed to win the Battle Royal tonight and turn the ship around. We need Dexter back. Yes, please. We had Roderick Strong and Damon Kemp. And this match was fine. It was not like a great match because it was essentially... Roderick Strong doing a very simple grappling basic style match with Damon Kemp. But everything they did look good. Damon Kemp is is totally fine in the ring. And uh, what happened in the end is the the uh, they cut backstage and the Creed brothers have been beat up. And Roderick Strong and Damon Kemp, who are part of Diamond Mine, they're obviously dist- they're both distracted by the video wall. And what should happen is Our buddies are getting beat up. We need to stop this match and run back and help them. Instead, as they're both distracted, Roderick does a jumping knee to his own partner and pins him. Then he runs to the back. And then Damon's like selling his his chin because he's all rattled from getting hit with the guy's finish. And he stumbles backstage and Roderick's burying him for taking too long to get back there to help everybody. So... The Diamond Mine storyline is a good storyline. They're they're doing a good job with with Roderick Strong. You just want to see all of Diamond Mine turn on him and beat him up. I'm sure he's hoping that happens too, so he can just get out of here. But uh, this was this was pretty good. Reminds people a lot of you, Roderick Strong, I believe. Pretty deadly. My one of my honest to God, one of my favorite teams against Josh Briggs and Brooke Jensen, and uh, the match was longer than it needed to be. But they're trying to teach people how to work. And they got the heat on Briggs and actually got the heat on the Virgin, I think, for a long time. And then he gave the hot tag to uh, to JB. That's how I remember their names because the other one's never getting any Brooks Jensen. So anyway, he uh, makes a big comeback. Crowd goes crazy for it. And then uh, uh, there's a tug of war with uh, – what's her name? I can never remember her name. Cause Fallon the, Henley. Fallon Henley. That's right. I remember. Because she she's uh, she's like on a farm, so she works with hens. That's how I'm trying to remember Fallon Henley. So anyway, she's got a tug of war and uh, ends up with Briggs schoolboying uh, Kit Wilson or whatever his name is, pinning him. Actually, no, they hit the high-low and pin him. But uh, this was fine. Thank God you remembered his name because I hate to say this because they're both great. Elton but it Prince is, and Kit Wilson, I believe. It's Elton Prince and then the other guy, but it's Elton Prince who really stands out. I know you need both of these guys to make it work, but my God, Elton. Elton amazing. Prince and Kit Wilson. He looks they're like the greatest. Timberland mixed with, like, what was the uh, Lance's guy from uh, Team of the Fandango? Oh, uh, Tyler Breeze. Yeah. He's got like, he's like this weird mix of people. He's amazing. Listen, uh, of all of the people that I've ever said are can't miss on the main roster, literally, pretty deadly, they have to be at the very top because there's nothing 
There's nothing that Vince could want to change. I guess maybe he could want him to be a little bit bigger, but they're tall. They have great hair. They're good looking. Yes. They've got a total sports entertainment gimmick. They work They work as total up his alley style, just every basic pro wrestling, old school tag. And Vince is a tag team fan. They're perfect for Vince McMahon. I don't know what they're doing stuck here. Oh, my God. The, but can you imagine bringing them up? They'd be immediately be maximum male models. Then we've got, uh, that's fine. That might actually turn that act around. That might so save get, maximum male models. Let's get Ginny in there first, or whoever it's going to be. Maxine. Joe Gacy reveals the former grizzled young vets as Jagger Reed and Rip Fowler. <laughs> Jagger Reed and Rip Fowler. Yeah. And they got one contact or something, and they got new yes, haircuts. What and the hell? The one with long hair is like a priest. Oh. And then the bald guy is like a zombie or something. I'm Some not sure. acolyte or something with yeah. the blue eye or cyborg. Okay, oh, so then God. we had Braun Breaker in the ring. Get out of here with this. And uh, J.D. McDonough shows up on the screen, and he's got a mannequin behind him. And, and Braun Breaker's in the ring, he's like, oh, what's going on? And I, I can't even say this is a straight face. J.D. McDonough apparently is like a, a surgeon. That's news to me. And so he gets his marker, and he says... Uh, it isn't exactly what he said, but it's, it's essentially what he said. He goes, Braun Breaker, are you aware there's eight muscles and tendons in the shoulder girdle? And Braun Breaker looks like he actually didn't know. And not only did he not know, he doesn't care. And he's looking at the fans like, what? And McDonough starts drawing on the shoulder of this mannequin, showing how he's going to dissect the shoulder of, of Braun Breaker. And Braun Breaker's like, dude, just come down here. I'm going to beat your ass. And J.D. McDonough refuses. And so they're going to have a match. But I know this is going to be like a title program. But, dude, J.D. McDonough is tiny. And Braun Breaker is huge. I realize they're doing the bad shoulder gimmick with Braun Breaker. But, bro, if you can sell me on this match, good luck. I don't buy it for a second. That promo and that interchange, it was almost so bad it was good because Braun was looking like you would think somebody would look hearing all of this slow motion nonsense come out of the face of J.B. McDonough. But like the way it was juxtaposed with Braun being in the arena and then barking back at this very slow talking J.D. McDonough who says he's going to do this to you, Braun, and you're a meathead and I know exactly what you're going to And Braun's losing it and absolutely losing it. It's exactly what you would expect, but boy, was it long and not good. The other thing, too, is uh, it's one thing. Listen, everybody, everybody does these suplexes. Everybody, every match. I guess it's one thing if if Karrion Cross is going to use that suplex as his finish or whatever, because he's a big jacked-up dude or whatever. But J.D. McDonough, this tiny little dude, his finish is a suplex. Axiom debuted, the former A kid, and uh, he they, they debuted him against Dante Chen, and it was fine. But Axiom needed a way different opponent to have like a big boom, 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 high spot flip, whatever, to get himself over. This was just a, a basic match with a couple of high spots. Didn't get the guy over. He now has a mask like a luchador, and I know some people are upset about that. But listen, the whole point of this. NXT is to get people ready for the main roster, okay? Vince takes one look at A-Kid. I don't care what he can do. He's even smaller, and he's not nearly as big as Ricochet. And look where Ricochet is, okay? So if you want to mask this guy up and put him in a costume and hope that he can be like another Rey Mysterio, fine. Because it's not going to work as A-Kid. It's just not. But he does need better opponents to showcase what he can do. And this was not that. Then we had like 90 segments in a row. Lash Legend, Giovanni Vinci's Mad at Chase U, Trick Williams in the Barbershop. And, uh, God, there were a million. Wait a second. You here. do know where they're going with some of these feuds because they just oh, throw sure. them right in your face. It's like, okay, here we go. It's Chase U, Giovanni Vinci. Why? Because the bus is blocking Vinci in the parking lot. Yeah. Well, Carmelo Hayes and we're going. Cameron Gr- or T- Trick Williams are talking about uh, whatever. They're the barbershop. Those segments are always good, but I don't know what they're talking about. Toxic Attraction <laughs> does an interview, and then one by one, women from the Battle Royal show up, and then uh, and that leads us to the Battle Royal. The only other segment we didn't talk about is they're doing a story with Cameron Grimes where he keeps losing, and he's lost it. 
and he's sick of it, and he's leaving, and he's just going to go home. He's done with this. But he gets stopped by, of all people, Joe Gacy, who's trying to recruit him for his group. So I don't know if they're actually going to recruit him for the group or if you're going to do a Cameron Grimes-Joe Gacy feud, which at least in the ring would be good because Joe Gacy can work. But God, I, that Joe Gacy character is television death. Death! Mm. So that's NXT, everybody. Uh, so he's got like a cult thing going on. He's trying to recruit people. You see what he's done to the grizzled young veterans. Maybe because Cameron Grimes is still so rich, I, uh, I assume that he is. Some of his investments have panned out because he's obviously not taking home the winner's share of the purses. Maybe Joe Gacy just wants to use him for his money and try to drain him of that. However this works... Like you mentioned, the work in the ring is going to be really good because those guys are really good inside the ring. But my God, everything else about this whole deal, including seeing the new grizzled young schism be involved in it, no thank you. I mean, Trevor Lee's going to get bounced around like a basketball trying to get those guys over and trying to make this thing work. And even though he'll probably be the conquering hero in the end, it's going to be a long way to get there, I have a feeling. So that was that, and uh, NXT 2.0. <laughs> I do think the Dynamite's going to be better tonight. That is my prediction. I think it's safe bet. I think it's probably a safe bet. Mandy Huber says if Brody Lee could see his son perform as negative one, he would be, quote, just bubbling over the moon. Did an interview... Brody Jr. spoke about the tribute show held in honor of his father. Holding the belt that my dad held just to be in the moment was definitely was very hard. I want to be just like him, he said. He also knows that when he's older, he wants to grow a big, bushy beard, just like his father as well. <laughs> Use moisturizer, kid. Amanda fired back at critics who accuse AEW of exploiting Brody. I personally don't feel they've exploited him or taken advantage of us. Everything's always felt to me like it's done with nothing but love. I think people are skeptical and pessimistic and assume it's a lot more sinister than it is. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. Back on the show, Brian Albert is here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sembervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. A lot of shows up for subscribers. Yeah. Brian and Vinny's show last night where we did a uh, Ric Flair's Last Match Poetry Contest. <laughs> Boy, did people just bury Ric Flair. And then I asked Granny about uh, watching the show, but I don't think she's going to. But Ric Flair's Last Match dot com, you can check it out. Enter this month in Nashville, and there's a lot of stuff going on that weekend. There's Starcast, Starcast Five, got the panels: Brian Danielson, Claudia Castagnoli, Horseman Reunion, Bret Hart talking SummerSlam '92, the former Page Foley, Nash Hardy, the roast of Ric Flair. We should have all those people that entered the poetry contest show up at that roast for Ric Flair. You should just read all that poetry. Got Black Label Pro, GCW on Friday. You going to that, Mike? If I was there, I would be. I got New Japan Saturday. Be going Ric to that, too. Ric Flair's last match at the Municipal Auditorium. $39 tickets at RicFlair'sLastMatch.com. And if you don't want to watch Ric Flair's last match... Well, you can watch a lot of other stuff because they got sh matches from the NWA, MLW, AAA, Impact, New Japan, Ring of Honor, AEW. And yes, believe it or not, the main event with Ric Flair's last match has a WWE executive on one side and an AEW wrestler on the other side. That would have been unheard of. I mean, last week, actually. But Jeff Jarrett is a hero. That's what they're doing. Jeff Jarrett. This guy's all over the place. SummerSlam, Ric Flair's last match, everywhere. So anyway, pay-per-view, cable, satellite, fight, RicFlair'sLastMatch.com. And we are out of time, everybody. What's today? Wednesday? I'll it be back is. later on tonight with Dave, Wrestling Observer Radio, for subscribers to WrestlingObserver.com. We'll talk AEW Dynamite and so much more. And all the news, the G1. I got to watch day three. Got to watch Filthy. So check it out, everybody. We'll talk to you next time. Wrestling Observer Live.